Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new here, hi, my name is Alia, I have a master's degree in aerospace engineering, and I make videos on aerospace engineering related topics every week. Remember, last time we learned about how rockets generate thrust, and you can watch this video here if you haven't seen it yet. And today, while we are at it, let's continue this topic for rockets and learn how to derive an equation that describes the motion of a rocket. In this video, we'll talk about a rocket equation or delta V equation. This equation will enable us to calculate the change of speed of the rocket and how much fuel would be needed for that maneuver. Okay, so the rocket equation was originally independently derived by three people. First, a British mathematician William Moore in 1810. Second, by a Russian scientist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in 1903. And third, by an American engineer Robert Goddard in 1912. But since Tsiolkovsky was the first one to apply this equation to see whether the rockets can achieve speeds necessary for space travel, this equation was called after him. And I think there is still some Cold War mentality in the US universities because they don't like giving credit to Russian scientists. For example, when we learned this equation at the university, we just called it the rocket equation and never mentioned the Tsiolkovsky. Or when we used the periodic table of elements in the chemistry lesson, we just called it the table of elements instead of Mendeleev's table because that's the inventor of the table of elements. So when I was a student, I checked the Wikipedia for this equation and it was just named the rocket equation. But I checked it today and it's actually named Tsiolkovsky rocket equation. So now I'm happy because the necessary credits were given where they needed to be. Okay, so let's continue with the topic. Usually when objects orbit Earth, they move around in a circular orbit. And once we put that object or spacecraft in an orbit, we don't have to worry about it because it will just stay in that orbit for a long time. It's a very nice equilibrium until something pushes it out of the equilibrium. For example, if we fire the engines for the rocket or a spacecraft, we will change the trajectory and we can move either closer to Earth or further from it. So what if we want to change orbits and go from Earth to Mars? Well, then we would need to give our rocket or spacecraft an additional boost to change its velocity, its energy, so that it's able to change the orbit and transfer itself to Mars's orbit. And we will talk a lot more about this in the future set of videos on orbital mechanics. But for now, let's continue with this question of how much fuel do we need to change the spacecraft's or rocket's velocity and go to another orbit. And we will start with the same principle that we used to derive the thrust equation. Remember, we start with generalized Newton's second law, which states that the sum of the forces acting on an object are equal to the change of momentum of that object. And since we need to find the change of momentum, we need to look at a rocket at two different time points or states. At the first point, we have the fuel on board and the velocity is already moving with some velocity. We call the mass of the rocket m, the mass of the fuel delta m, and the velocity of the rocket just v. At the second time point or state, we already burned out that fuel that was inside the rocket. So it's out, but still has the same mass, delta m. And now the velocity is moving with a higher velocity, v plus delta v. So basically burning that fuel gave us an additional boost to the velocity called delta v. But here we need to notice that when the fuel was burning or exiting the rocket, it had some velocity with which it was exiting the rocket. Let's call it u sub e or u exhaust, velocity exhaust. But now if we zoom out of this picture and consider this fuel moving out of the rocket, but relative to Earth, we know that the fuel exits the rocket with that speed, ue, but it's relative to the rocket. So actually this fuel is moving up with the rocket and still exiting. So basically we can call the velocity of a rocket going up 
V and the speed of the fuel going down U sub E. So the speed of this fuel relative to Earth is going to be V minus U sub E, which is a difference of the rocket's upwards velocity and the fuel's exiting velocity. So now that we have defined all the variables, let's measure the momentum of the rocket with fuel and the rocket without a fuel at these two states. All right, so before the fuel was used, what is the momentum of this whole system? Well, remember that the momentum is mass times velocity of the system. In this case, what's the mass? We have the mass of the rocket plus the mass of the fuel. Everything multiplied by the velocity of the rocket because all of these are moving with the same velocity. So at point one, everything is simple. What about point two? At the second point, we have two things which are moving, the rocket with its higher velocity V plus delta V, and the fuel that's now outside the rocket. It's moving relative to the rocket with U sub E, but relative to the Earth, it's moving with the velocity V minus U sub E. So the total momentum now is going to be the mass of the rocket with its velocity and the mass of the fuel with its velocity. So now we need to find the change of momentums according to Newton's second law. How would we do that? Just subtract P1 from P2. Okay, so P2 minus P1 is now going to be M V plus delta V, just copy everything. But let's open the brackets. Now we can cancel some of the same terms, which give us zero in the sum. So we are only left with two actual terms in this equation. And I put velocity in the front so that we have delta M term in the end for convenience. Now remember that at first we assumed two separate time moments for the rocket. But in reality, the mass of the propellant changes little by little every second. So we need to use infinitely small changes instead of deltas. Now, in order to accommodate for the infinitely small changes, we need to change the difference of momentums into dp and the change in velocity into dv and the change of mass into dm. So this is our infinitely small change of momentum now. But remember Newton's second law, which says that the sum of the forces is the change of momentum. But in our case, the change of momentum is given with this equation. So this is actually dp. So let's rearrange this equation to have the forces and the time derivative. Okay, so let's divide each term here by dt so that our equation looks separate for these two terms. And let's bring the first multiplier here so that it looks cleaner. All right, now it looks better. And finally, let's remember that if the rocket is in space, we can assume negligible gravitational force. So this sum of the forces would be zero. So what can we get from this equation is that m dv dt should be equal to ue dm dt. Now we see a common denominator dt so we can multiply by that to get rid of it and now we don't need this picture anymore so let's just deal with this equation so now remember that our goal was to find the delta v equation so let's express dv separately and m and dm on the other side now how do we get rid of these infinitely small changes well we can integrate the equation on both sides between two points Let's call these points two velocities of the rocket and two masses of the rocket, m1 and m2. So the left side of this equation is just the integral of 1 dx, which becomes x between the two points which are given, which just becomes the difference of v2 and v1. And on the right-hand side, we can take out the speed with which the fuel is exiting the rocket as constant take it out of the integral. And now this integral looks like the integral of one over x dx, which is the natural logarithm between two points. So now instead of the integral, we'll have natural log between two masses. All right, now remember the properties of the logarithms where 
if they're subtracted, we can divide their respective arguments. And on the left side, let's just start calling this difference of two velocities, delta v. Okay, now remember that the mass at the second point is smaller than the mass at the first point because the fuel has burned. So the rocket became lighter. So if we have a logarithm of a smaller number divided by a larger number, it's going to be negative. This would be a negative value. So in order to avoid the negative value, let's just switch these two. And for convenience, let's call the first mass m0 or m initial of the rocket. And the second mass, the final mass of the rocket after the fuel has been burned. So now we have this equation that relates the change of velocity of the rocket to the difference in mass or basically the difference of the fuel that has been burned between these two points. And this is the rocket equation. We see that it relates the change in velocity necessary for some maneuver to the change in fuel or the amount of fuel that we need in order to accomplish that. This change in velocities or delta v is a very important parameter to consider for planning the space mission. Because if we miscalculate delta v, then we miscalculate the amount of fuel that we need. And in that case, we can't reach the destination, which can turn into a disaster if we have people on board. So I hope this video gave you a good understanding of how a rocket equation is derived. In the next videos, we will consider the rocket equation when there's gravity involved, which means that the rocket is just lifting off from the ground or inside the atmosphere. We will also talk about the characteristic of the rocket engine or ISP. We can also talk about staging and why it's useful and efficient. And we will also look at some practice problems for all of these topics that I covered recently. So if you don't want to miss any of those, subscribe to my channel right now and don't forget to like this video if it was helpful for you. You can also check out my other videos here and the playlists about aerodynamics and propulsion that I created for you. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I see you next week.